So I want to take a look at specifically the 6502, the microprocessor released by Moss in the 1970s. That processor is at the heart of most of the early 80s home computing scene, including the BBC Micro, the Electron, if you're in the UK, you'll remember those two. The Commodore 64 had a version of the 6502, which was the 6510. The original Nintendo Entertainment System also used a 6502. And most of the Atari machines, including the 400 and 800. It was also used in one of the iconic first home computers by a big tech company. Yes, the Apple I and Apple II, for that matter, used a 6502 processor. And the other advantage is they still make them today. Not exactly the MOS 6502, but there are 6502 processors you can buy today. And that makes it an interesting prospect for tinkering about with. What we're actually going to do is look at how hard it would be to write an emulator for the 6502 processor. Can't be that hard, can it? It's only 8-bit. So the first thing you have to do if you want to emulate a 6502 is actually understand what a 6502 does what its instructions mean and how it behaves. There's loads of information online about the 6502. Find a reference that works for you. I used this one. It wasn't perfect, had a few mistakes, but it got me there in the end. One thing to call out early is that most opcodes on the 6502 can use different addressing modes. Not all instructions have them, and even the ones that do don't necessarily support every mode. Each instruction lists which addressing modes it supports. For example, some assume you're working directly with the accumulator. Now, you might be wondering what's an accumulator? I was with you all the way up to Simply. And if you did want to tinker with the 6502, you could go to PCBWay Shared Projects. They've got loads of 6502 based projects, including a 50th anniversary badge. And given the time of the year, you could also create something for Halloween. They've got plenty of Halloween and ghost themed PCB projects, as well as the odd 3D print. PCBWay can provide prototype PCBs for as little as $5. And if you don't want to assemble them yourself, they can even do that for you. They also have additional services like 3D printing, CNC machining and sheet metal fabrication so you can bring all of your projects to life. All of this is available at PCBWay.com. Thanks PCBWay for sponsoring this video. The accumulator is basically where most of the math and logic happens. Then there are the X and Y registers which are usually used as index registers, useful for stepping through memory. All three can hold a byte and you can transfer data between them to a point. There's also the program counter, which is literally the CPU's bookmark, the memory address of the instruction it's currently executing. That's the only 16-bit register on the 6502, because it needs to hold a full memory address. If it were only 8-bit, we could only address 256 bytes of RAM, not exactly useful. The 16-bit address space means we can access up to 64K of memory. Now, the 6502 uses memory mapped addressing for everything. Whether it's RAM, ROM or hardware registers, it's all accessed through the same address and data buses. Next up, the status register. This holds a bunch of internal flags. These are just bits representing the result of the last operation, whether it was zero, negative, overflowed, triggered decimal mode, and so on. And speaking of decimal mode, I didn't bother implementing that. It's rarely used. It's basically a legacy feature that makes the CPU do arithmetic in binary coded decimal, which isn't really relevant today. Other flags include the interrupt disable bit, the zero flag, literally was the result zero, and the carry flag. If you're not sure what those mean, there are plenty of good write-ups online explaining how they behave in detail. The final register is the stack pointer. That's 8-bit, but it points to a 16-bit memory address, specifically one fixed page in RAM. We've got what's called zero page memory, which is the very first 256 bytes of RAM, from 0000 to 00FF. That's fast to access because it only needs a single byte address. The stack, on the other hand, lives on page 1, from 0100 to 01FF. Those are the only hard-coded memory ranges the 6502 uses directly. Some other locations are reserved for vectors, which brings us neatly to what happens when the CPU starts up. When a 6502 powers on, it takes a few cycles, then looks up a fixed reset vector in memory. That's a hard-coded address, specifically at FFFC and FFFD, which holds the 16-bit memory address where execution should begin. So those two bytes form a pointer to your program's start location. 
The CPU loads that into the program counter and off it goes. When it came to implementing the 6502 in code, I started simple with LDA, Load Accumulator. It's probably the easiest opcode to get working. LDA can use several addressing modes, three non-index modes. Immediate, which just loads the next byte of the program counter directly into the accumulator. Zero page, where the next byte is treated as a zero page address. Absolute, which uses two bytes to form a full 16-bit address. And two index modes. Zero page, X, which adds the value of the X register as an offset. Absolute, Y, which works like absolute, but adds the Y register as an additional offset. Index modes are handy when stepping through arrays or iterating over memory. Let's jump to an early commit. You can see a few unit tests already in place. The one we'll focus on here is for LDA. My very first test was intentionally simple. Create a dead machine that started up and did nothing. That helped define what the default state looked like. All vectors set to zero, no code to run. That isn't realistic behavior, but it gave me a baseline. From there, I built a functional loop that took a CPU state, executed a single instruction, and produced a new state, one cycle per step. That allowed me to write tiny pieces of raw machine code, not assembly, but actual opcodes, and execute them. I defined every opcode and included a special kill instruction, which halts the CPU. That's a non-standard but widely accepted opcode that just stops execution. I use that as my program terminator instead of looping forever. Here's a simple example test. I load the accumulator using LDA, using immediate addressing, followed by a byte FE, so A, the accumulator, will equal FE. Then I run ADC01, which adds 1 to the current content of A. That should result in A containing FF. Then using ST8 with zero page addressing, followed by the address as a byte, 1, 0, which stores the current contents of A into zero page address 0010. Next, using LDA again, this time in zero page addressing, followed by the address as a byte 10, which is loading that value back again from zero page memory address 10. And finally, we end execution with kill. At the end of the test, we assert that A holds the byte value FF and that the negative flag is set. Why negative? Because FF in 2's complement is negative, that is, the highest bit, bit 7, is set. Anything with that bit set is treated as negative. You can find more information on 2's complement online. So, let's run that test, and with a bit of luck, it should pass. Implementation-wise, I probably should have committed more often. This started as a hobby project, and only later became a video idea. But here's where it ended up. The CPU core uses a big switch statement, eventually converted to a switch expression. Each OCPO handler reads from memory, performs its operation, and writes the result back to a new CPU state. For memory, I used an address space interface, implemented using a simple dictionary with an unsigned short index and a byte value. That maps 16-bit addresses to byte values, defaulting to zero if an address hasn't been written yet. Later, I added an overlay system, a way to delegate parts of the address space to other components, like I.O. devices, so they could respond differently to reads and writes. Jumping forward to a near final version, the code is much cleaner and better abstracted. We've got a CPU state struct with the program counter, stack pointer, flags, and the A, X, and Y registers. The address space abstraction has functions for reading and writing bytes, handling vectors, and managing overlays. The overlay system allows hardware-like behavior, mapping devices into memory ranges, just like a real 6502 system. At this point, all opcodes were implemented, and I added a simple exception for the kill instruction to stop execution gracefully. My first thought was to emulate BBC Micro, since I know the hardware pretty well. But I quickly realized how complex the custom chips are. It's a big job to get all the peripherals talking correctly. So I scaled back the ambition and targeted something simpler, the Apple One. That was a great choice, a small, well-documented machine with minimal hardware. I could focus on getting the CPU and memory mapping right. After setting up a few more unit tests, I loaded the Apple One's ROMs and wrote a small harness to run its monitor program. And yes, it actually worked. I could boot into basic, type commands, and see output in the console window. Doing the iconic basic test, 10, print hello, 20, go to 10, and sure enough, it looped hello forever. That was a surreal moment. Fueled by this success, I extended the emulator with a simple external 64x64 LED display and added color control. By writing values to specific memory map addresses, would change foreground and background colors or clear the screen. It's primitive, 
but it shows the concept of mapped hardware beautifully. So that's my C Sharp 6502 emulator, functional, object oriented where it makes sense and capable of running an Apple One. For now though, I hope you've enjoyed the video and maybe it's inspired you to try writing your own emulator. Start simple, pick a processor you like and you'll learn so much along the way.